is it possible to make an AI robot that made AI art that critiqued and commented and questioned the rise of AI in the 2020s? So I went to lots of robotics companies. I went to the, obviously, the university at Oxford here. And I said, I'd like to make a robot. They laughed me out of the house. How are you? Good evening. Good afternoon. Good evening. Yes. <laughs> God save the king, I guess. Is that what I'm supposed to say? I should curtsy. <laughs> There's quite a lot of media around it, I would agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were we were concerned that you might not make it on here today because it's, uh, you know, so much happening. I think the queue for the funeral on Monday is already starting to form. Oh, wow, really? <laughs> I, they genuinely do think about a million people will go. Wow. Jeez. Oh, what a security nightmare as well. What a scary security nightmare. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Have you spent your whole life in the UK? I have. I, have. I had a small stint of working in India. Um, but yes, the vast majority of my time is here. I, I live just outside Oxford, so it would be a very difficult place to leave. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oxford and I were there once. It's quite yeah. extraordinary. But you know, you you look at such classic art. You grew up with such classic art, you know, like Picasso and things yeah. like that. You know, so how did how did that all come about? So my original specialism, as I was a gallery director for over twenty years in modernism, so School of Paris and modern British. So we sold works by Picasso, Matisse, Chagall. On the British side, it was Henry Moore, Hepworth, St Ives Group. And we were located in Oxford because, of course, of the Sackler Library and the Bodleian, which we had an enormous association with for provenance. We were became experts for the provenance side of artworks. And it was with that that uh, we approached a very academic approach and got a very quite a significant reputation for modernism in that sense. And it was because of doing School of Paris that gave the original idea for Ada Robot. Can you believe it? It actually was born out of studying modernism. So it was quite an extraordinary moment. She does look a little French to me. <laughs> you know, the pre-Raphaelites, how did you, how did you stumble upon some unseen pre-Raphaelite work? So the pre-Raphaelites was most extraordinary. We, we had a separate department. I had three gallery spaces and we had pre-Raphaelites in that one of those. Obviously, because of the association with Oxford, we the gallery was right next door to Exeter College, where, of course, William Morris and Millet were. And we literally just down the road from where Millet had his studio. So it was a perfect location for the pre-Raphaelites. And as a result of that, we became quite specialist, and I have in my own home, in fact, quite a few of their works. However, the most remarkable thing is we got a telephone call in the gallery. They said they had some pre raphaelite works, would like to come and have a look. I don't get too excited because the misattribution, people's misattribution for them are pretty awful. So we have to go along and, and gently let them down that in actual fact they've not got what they thought they had. But in this one instance, they had seven large cardboard boxes full of drawings and just the very nature of the way that they were just thrown down. They were not trying to sell these to me. They literally were just out the loft. I went and looked through them and the hairs on the back of my neck, I, can, I just knew they were right. And they were stained glass window drawings. After a lot a protracted conversation, we eventually got to a decision that we would purchase. They were happy. We were happy. I got them home. I started to unroll them. Most of them were rolled up. So we were unrolling them very gently to be able to photograph them, to upload them to Google Drive so my team, my researchers can start doing the provenance. And as I was unrolling them, I was thinking, I'm sure they said it was about 50 odd drawings. And in it transpired, there was 117 drawings. Mm -hmm. wow. And in actual fact, they came from Powell and Son, the largest stained glass window manufacturer in the UK at that time, who went actually bankrupt in the 1920s. In the 1920s, because they're quite pretty, as they thought, they put them in the loft and they stayed there for the next 80 odd years wow. and eventually they just wanted shut off and we were able to I went back to them and I said look 
I've unfairly bought these. These are actually remarkable and I need to pay you more. And they were very grateful for that. And I said, this, I'm going to add, end the story in a tragedy. I said, just because I'm being upfront and open with you and I want a good relationship with you, have you got any more? Is this just the tip of the iceberg? And so we agreed to figure on the upgrade because it was a bigger thing than we originally realised. But they said, actually, we had eight further boxes, all of which went to the skip. Oh, oh my God. And I said, can you tell me where? And it's already in landfill. Yeah, wow. So, so eight boxes of pre-Raphaelite works went to landfill. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Can you believe yeah. it? So that's my pre flight story of 117 unseen. And we obviously, none of them had been recorded before. So we got professional photography. We've got the conservation mounted. And we were able to then start getting them published in books and recognized in, in the pre raphaelite publication world. In fact, it, just above me, the, the, this work here is a Burne Jones stained glass window drawing. So, yeah, we, we, we certainly done a bit of work in the pre raphaelite world. You know, don't you think it's a miracle, though, that anything does get preserved? I mean, when you think about it, <laughs> I mean, all the stuff that we don't know that's gone. I mean, what you yeah. don't know won't hurt you, right? But now you know. So it's sort of miraculous to even do art con conservation, yeah? Well, who would think in this day and age, and that was about 2010, was it? Something like that. Who would believe that you could still find a cache of pre raphaelite works that hadn't been discovered before? You just wouldn't think that was possible. So it's been a really fascinating and intriguing life. I've only been in the art world. I've been here a very long time and has, as I say, three spaces in which they specialise in different ways. But by a long way, our major area was modernism. And it was, as I say, from that born the world of Ada Robot. So were you interested in artificial intelligence the whole time? Or I, I mean... Do you want me to briefly tell you about how Ada Robot came into being? With that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, how did your interest go from classic things? You know, to... It's a bit of a jump, isn't it? Yeah. It really is. So the story of Ada, I'll try and do it as concisely and as briefly as I can. So basically, I had a small contemporary space as well for living artists. Well, they weren't all dead artists we sold. And we had a gentleman come in who was an artist, he wanted to have us represent him. He showed us his work, his wares. Um, they were very good. He was a technically competent, good artist. For whatever reason, I sadly said, I think you're great. I think your work is lovely, but it's not for us. I'm so sorry. We don't want to spread ourselves too thinly, and I don't think it's going to be a match. So off he went, and as I sat down, Next to my desk was a Picasso drawing to my right and a Turner drawing above the mantelpiece. And as he, I was ruminating on this gentleman who had walked in, I was looking at the Picasso and I was looking at the Turner and a terrible thought came to me. This is relevant to the robot. A terrible thought came to me. The Picasso work and the Turner work isn't very good. These are actually <laughs> not great works. I, I, I said the unsayable. Why is it that they're so successful when they're technically less competent than the guy that had just been rejected and walked out the door? So I made it my business to try and answer that most ridiculous of questions. What makes great art great? So what I did is I came home, I got some wallpaper, and I put the wallpaper around the entire room and used them as columns like an Excel file. And I did everybody who was big, Michelangelo, Raphael, Donatello, all the way through to people like Turner and Constable, to uh, Picasso, Matisse, to Andy Warhol, and then the modern giants, you know, people like Ai Weiwei and Damien Hirst and Jeff Koons and the like. And what I did is I used them as a way of stratifying their life. So where they were born, when they were born, what social economic situation they were born into, what was their big break, what was their education, who was representing them, what museums took them on board. And at the bottom, they were dead. And what I was able to do is be able to compare Jeff Koons with Turner. I was able to compare Tracy Emin with Michelangelo. Really weird thing to be able to do. And the goal was to get a blueprint that basically said, this is what the top 1% artists are doing. This is what makes great work. And that was my ambition. I did this for three months. 
and huge amount of books I had to look through to get all the information out of, huge amount of alcohol to be able to <laughs> cope with the <laughs> nights of constantly putting it up. And eventually came to the end, I couldn't see anything. Warhol was nothing like Turner. Michelangelo was nothing like Marina Abramovich. They were completely maverick, different, separate. So I came downstairs, saw my partner, and I said, my big ambition of finding a blueprint is not working. I'm going to officially give up. She said, hang on, you're just asking the wrong questions. Well, so with absolute frustration, I went up the, other, the next night, because I did it in the evenings, and I didn't look at the walls. I just looked at my questions. What was I not asking? I looked at their backgrounds, their education, their breaks, their galleries, their location. I thought I'd asked the right questions. Clearly not. And then it suddenly occurred to me, I hadn't compared their audiences. Who was looking at Michelangelo's work in Michelangelo's time? Mm. Who was looking at Turner's work in Turner's time? Who was looking at Damien Hirst's work, Damien Hirst's time? So I did something really unusual, compared audiences. And do you know what? I had this massive epiphany. Every single top artist, the 1%, the greatest of great, all did one thing, and I haven't found anybody to an exception. They all studied and explored what society was worried about. Mm. Every single top artist, whether it be Michelangelo and the Medici family, whether it's Turner and Constable and the rise of the Industrial Revolution, whether it was Warhol and the rise of consumerism, whatever it was, it was whatever was in society and they were uncomfortable with. Right. So I asked the question, here we are in the 2020s, what are we uncomfortable with today? What are we worried about? What are we bothered by? So the third and final section of this little project I set myself was to compare the near futures according to various experts. So I read 22 books about the near future, the next five to 10 years. I read politicians, economists, I read cultural elite. What were they saying is about to happen? Of course, they disagreed. And so in my spare room this time, I put up new paper and I did a Venn diagram of where they disagreed and when they agreed to see what was in the middle of the Venn diagram. And they disagreed in terrible ways. So I'm never going to ex trust a future expert ever again because they have no idea what the future is going to be, clearly. Yeah. However, what there was one thing that was unanimous across every single future expert, and that was the rise of AI, its disruption to every industry, mm. whether it was agriculture, manufacturing, high-tech, whatever it was, AI is going to be the disrupting force. So as part of that, I went, well, I need to study AI. I was part of the university, so I went to the Oxford Machine Learning Department and was starting to speak to the AI guys there. And they was listening to me of my interest in it. And I said, teach me what AI is, what it's about, where it's going. And while that was happening, I was playing with my son. He was young at that time. He's a bit older now. He made a little Lego robot. And it was an absolute lightning bolt. Is it possible to make an AI robot that made AI art that critiqued and commented and questioned the rise of AI in the 2020s? So I went to lots of robotics companies. I went to the obviously the university at Oxford here, and I said, I'd like to make a robot. They laughed me out of the house. They said, no, that's a ridiculous idea, and no one would back it. So in the end, I had to back myself. And we got a company called Engineered Arts to make the body. And we've got then various PhD students to look at this word creative creativity. And from that, over 30 people put Ada Robot together. It became a very big project very rapidly. We had over 30 people, 15 programmers, and it was a multi-million pound robot. As a result of that, we pioneered in lots of ways. We went down lots of dead ends. And finally we were able to produce on the 11th of February, 2019, the announcement to the world that there was going to be a creative robot artist. 
We had lots of dead ends. We had to define what creative meant. In the end, we used Professor Margaret Bowden's definition of creativity, of new, surprising, and of value. The algorithms that Ada uses are all new. They are surprising. We don't know quite what she's going to do. We're looking over her shoulder. And when we first launched her first exhibition at St. John's College at the University of Oxford, over 900 publications covered that very first exhibition. It went absolutely epic, overwhelming. We were then invited all around the world with this new robot. So we went to amazingly high level. So we went to the Barbican, we went to the Tate, we went to the V&A, we went to the Design Museum. She did a TEDx talk. The Royal Academy director, Tim Marlowe, interviewed her. The interest, we went to Ars Electronica in Austria. We went to Abu Dhabi, to Abu Dhabi, we went to Dubai. People's interest in Ada was just extraordinary. And then during the pandemic, obviously we couldn't travel so much, so we continued to develop her. And so she's now able to do sculpture as well as painting and drawing. And she's able to do it by sight. She looks at you, she has cameras in her eyes. She's able to take the image in, interpret the image. The word interpret is remarkable for a robot and be able to expressively then paint or draw or now sculpt what she sees with her eyes. She uses a language model in which she speaks. So any ideas for the artwork, we ask her what she wants to do. That's pretty mind blowing in itself. And she is dramatically developed and we're in an extremely busy time even now at the weekend ada was at the bodleian library in a couple of weeks time ada speaks at the house of lords first time a robot has ever gone to the house of lords we then fly to abu dhabi in october she's going to be the keynote speaker at the culture summit she's then going to the louvre in abu dhabi it's the most extraordinary story and we are currently talking with a whole load of people, including television companies on a television series, to be able to cover this re- very weird, very weird story of how Ada became what she is today. I mean, it is extraordinary, but I, you, you, you love her. You have a great, great affection for her, yeah? I, I, mean, I think the innovation is very remarkable, genuinely, because it's so left of field. The reason the reaction from the press was so great is because they thought robots were maybe delivering pizza or Amazon logistics. They didn't expect to be doing something so human. And so to do something genuinely innovative in the creative field with using technology was something that sidestepped. And it was so early on, robots, people only just getting used to having robots. And then suddenly a robot came into the whole field doing something very human. And so she polarizes audience. She really does polarise audience. People absolutely love her or people despise her and think she's a threat. And everywhere we get, we get the two reactions of absolute adoration of her or absolute fear of her. In fact, even when we went to Egypt, we were asked by the Egyptian government for Ada to do a sculpture next to the pyramids. First time in four and a half thousand years, they allowed art to be next to the pyramids. And when Ada arrived, they then took her off as said she was a spy, she wasn't an artist, and it was just a cover for surveillance. People are very nervous about technology. And so I'm sorry I've like just monologued at you, but it was just a very quick overview of everything that Ada's about. So, you know, you go to the, to the, uh, the group at Oxford that's doing machine learning, right, which implies a certain kind of technology, and what technology are they actually deploying inside the robot? There's actually quite a lot because she does many things simultaneously. So the the what is depending on the result. So there's different technology running her ability to speak. There's different technology for her to do the algorithms to be creative. She even has an awareness that you're there. If you get close to Ada, she'll pull back because she knows you're there. There's facial recognition. There's robotics on all sorts of different levels. She doesn't walk, but she's very agile in every other way. So a lot of those technologies are very normal technologies, but the the part here that's very unusual is that it's taking a prompt of some sort and then it's it's making art out of it. And you're saying you don't know there's some sort of black box in terms of how it's coming up with the art, which implies very high computation. What is that thing? You know, is it looking at the 
Is it visually looking at something and then making an algorithm out of the visual thing? Is it taking the words around the prompt and turning them into text prompts, you know? Great question. Yeah, it's not Dali. So basically, she is taking the visual data from her site and interpreting that in a layering process that then replots itself through real-time coordinates to enable her to paint and draw. So the, the cleverness is the fact that she is genuinely taking insight and interpreting that Im image. The most remarkable thing about algorithms, of course, is that they can make their own decisions. She's making a huge amount of decisions in the interpretation. So because there's so many variables, we don't know what the artwork that she will do will be produced. So like an artist who has a body of, you know, a style, for example, you know, we, you talked about all these greats, Turner and Picasso and Warhol, and, you know, does she have her style? Are the algorithms or whatever's going on there technically or with the AI is remembering, or is she just spitting out a lot of different, or not spitting out, but creating, you know, different styles? We very deliberately, because I have an art history background, we very deliberately didn't get her to copy a style. So she doesn't do cubism or impressionism or anything like that. That's not our interest. The greatest artist innovated the visual language. And so the work that she does is unique in its style to her. There's some expressive quality, but we're not trying to be expressionism. So the idea is, is that we're trying to get a computer vision, a robot vision of the paint. So you'll see that there's some geometry to it there is lines and dashes and dots but it's still very expressive and so we're wanting to pioneer in a new style we weren't trying to do anything from art history you know when you say the first part is you're questing to try and understand what great art is right which is you know a subjective question what is great art to you or to me or to anybody else you know, we can agree on pre-Raphaelites, but maybe there's certain other forms we don't necessarily think are, are great art. Does, does Ida take the visual and then look at a set of things that you've pre-decided are great art and then compare and come up with some new interpretation? Yeah, no, there's no generative collaboration with other artworks. It really is just from her site. So it doesn't compare to any other data set. It just does it within itself. It's just purely it, from the data of the visual. You know, the, the um, underlying technology, is it a regression algorithm? How, what, what kind of algorithm is it that's helping it to get to what it thinks is the, the because, you know, if you ask a robot, it can design 10,000 perfect chairs that have never been seen by man before but it, it's very difficult for the robot to choose the one it's going to show you so how does it how does it you know how does it choose yeah it's a decision tree that goes through to make the final result so the reason the final outputs are so different is because the decision tree through which she gets to the final result is so different and so the best thing is to try and YouTube if, or come and see if they're real. Yeah. Uh, but you'll actually see her in, in operation. It's pretty mesmerizing to see how she's trying to work out, how the algorithm is trying to work out how to do the visual output. Now, when you go to Egypt and you're looking at the pyramids, do you walk around before and go, OK, the vantage point will be here and this is with a view that it'll see? Yeah, it literally is from what she sees. So wherever she is, could be the hotel room, but uh, we try and put it on something slightly prettier. But uh, yeah, it, basically what she sees. Interesting. There's so many questions. It's just, it is mind blowing and exciting. And, you know, I have seen some it's of It's a bit crazy. Right. What's particularly crazy is the fact that you can ask her. The That's really, crazy. the real head shift stuff where you go, this isn't right. <laughs> this yeah, is, no, this that's my question. So Jesse's calling her the, they, or you know, Jesse's asking. To, speaking of the robot in sort of a, agnostic terms, you're definitely seeing her as a female, and you know. So just why did you decide, or was it a collective that decided that she would be? A yeah, she it's pretty much a collective decision. There's, as I say, there's a whole big team behind Ada, male and female, fifty-fifty. And what changed the complete conversation was, well, what type of human, you know, what kind of character we started to ask questions like that. And actually what 
completely transform the conversation is we mentioned the name Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace is the most astonishing, really there needs to be a Hollywood movie made of her. Basically, she is the extraordinary in that she was brilliant. She was in a male dominated world where her voice was sidelined to the appendix of a man's book. You know, all the horror stories of inequality. And we actually say, actually, we need to honor Ada Lovelace, because she's the most extreme, and she did the very first computer program of all time. This is a woman in history, a remarkable woman in history, we would love to honor. And so the looks and her name have both been taken from Ada Lovelace. How do you get her to start to work? Like, what is that process like? And yeah, we literally and- speak to her. Yeah. And we can ask her questions. What do you think about this? What are your thoughts on, you know, she, the, the, the database in which she's able to speak is so enormous. So she, you right. can pick a topic and she's able to then respond to that. It's the entire internet, really. So the ability for her to speak about a wide range is, is phenomenal. It's mind-blowing. How did you get to the design of the actual robot? How did you get to Ada's physical design? We wanted to it to be auto realistic, so you were fully engaged with the thought of it being human. She blinks. The skin is phenomenal. If you actually saw it, you wouldn't actually believe it was false. It's so uncannily remarkable, the skin particularly. She has obviously eyes that really do look like human eyes. And so we wanted that believability in the way that she looks. But we also wanted you to know that she was a robot. So she's got very robotic arms and body. And the idea is, is that we are deliberately doing a provocation of confusion. It is very disorientating speaking with Ada. She disorientates, she confuses. We are very much celebrating that. We are celebrating that on some level she deceives. She's somehow wrong. And the reason for that is we want to very much highlight the ethical problems of technology today. The mimicry is so good, and yet it's not a human. There is no consciousness here. Ada is not real. She is a persona. She is not biological. She is not conscious. And we're very clear on that. However, she doesn't look like that. She looks real. She looks biological. She looks like you could have a relationship with her. But she's a machine. And we're realizing that we are going rapidly into a state of time that confusion, that mimicry is going to be very dangerous. The fact that with language models, you're able to speak to your car, your phone, this is going to happen in the next three years. You'll be able to speak to your appliances. That's all coming. That technology, GTP4, whatever it will be in the end, is going to be rolled out in the next couple of years. Ada is just slightly ahead of the game because she's cutting edge. It's very confusing. So we want to highlight that confusion. Because people are going to be confused with the so-called person in their phone, the so-called person in the metaverse that they're meeting as an avatar, you know, all the Ready Player One stuff. It's going to be very disorientating. And so Ada is trying to foreshadow the problematic ethics of this next technological step that we're going to be making as a humankind. The project at the end of the day, and this is where I've got finally to my goal, The goal of this project is an ethical one. Ada is trying to ask questions by provoking difficult ethical scenarios in order for the public to tangibly grab hold of and be able to speak about. AI is invisible. You can't see it. It's like electric. It's hard to know it's there. However, its impact is very real. And so Ada makes that very tangible for people to be able to speak about. And the artworks are provocation to be able to speak about the difficulties of the age that we're going into. You know, you talked about cognition. You know, what is the difference between cognition and not cognition? Or indeed the difference between life and death. We, we find that it's extremely hard to define what life is as we go into synthetic biology, which is a very big area now, what is actually this thing called being alive? And in fact, there's no way of defining what consciousness is. So we are going into quite a, by the 2030, we're going to be in a very difficult, different world. And the 
crossroads of technology that we're coming across are going to be very challenging. And we're hoping that the ADA project is helping to distangle, to enable to us to tangibly start navigating some of this new territory. I'd love to ask about the about the sort of heresy problem. You know, I mean, religious sectors or whatever, how how is she perceived or you know, what has been the response? Is it sort of like it's witchcraft, sorcery? Like, you know, you said there's the haters and the lovers. I'd like to hear about the dissent and who some of the groups might be. It, it really does range on depending on what your view is of the future. We find that there's a more broad brush approach. Some people who are excited by the future embrace her. Those who are fundamentally not excited and worried about the future condemn her and so it's not so much on religious groups it is actually the attitude of where we're going as a humankind you know the artwork has a certain look to it you know so it doesn't physically draw the painting it doesn't physically make the painting right it's, yeah she does yeah she does so With she a hand and a paintbrush okay you know like when we see things like go where it makes moves that are beyond what a human could think of you know does Ada make art that's beyond what our thinking could be? By a long way. She uses a deep neural network to do the Cartesian works. And the original works that she did at St. John's College were these environmental Cartesian works. And the mathematics, in order for her to have done the breakup of the scene for her to have actually painted, without some kind of digital approach to that it would have been impossible for a human to do unless you're a professor of mathematics it would have been very challenging and she does it within seconds of course and so we very much are aware that Ada's is doing artworks that would be beyond what a human does you know the chips you know what kind of chips are you using to build this neural network well again depending on what the focus is of the output. She has four computers inside her. You know, it is a complex robot. So she has a, she even has a computer in her arm. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of processing doing different. She's not one thing, but nor are we. Are we the subject of our parents, our culture, our background, our context? Well, she's no different. She has many aspects that make up Ada. So does she use computation outside of herself or is it all? physically within the robot yes and no the reason why it's a yes and no is because sometimes it's outside but it manifests finally within her so that's why it, there's a, a dual aspect to that the person we celebrate the most is actually Yuval Harari's work I don't know whether you know Yuval yeah, Harari's work obviously Sapiens is his masterpiece but actually things like Homo Deus and 21 Lessons mm -hmm. are really pointing and going into the way that data is going to be used in the future. The reason we've made such a big thing at the Venice Biennale about the metaverse is because we think that fundamentally the metaverse is going to change the world. You know, when it's launched this autumn, we feel that's going to be a, a thin end of a wedge of massive change in how we're going to interrelate with each other. And that's why we've made such a fuss over the metaverse, both at the V&A and the Venice Biennale, because we believe that those societal shifts are going to be very, very significant. Now, how was the, uh, the, the Queen received? Right? Didn't she do? She did? She did. She did the very fir the first time the Queen has ever been painted by an ultra-realistic robot artist. Again, people were like, what, the Queen? How's that relevant? Well, actually, it's highly relevant because the Queen's reign covered the 70 years from Alan Turing to today. So it was very poignant that actually her reign pretty much exactly covers the yeah. rise of modern-day AI. And so we called it Algorithm Queen because it was algorithms that made the final painting. And it's caused quite a stir. In fact, there's we're in the middle of a project about where that artwork might be placed in a, a quite a prominent public location, which I can't reveal at this moment. But uh, very, yeah. it was a very exciting moment for the public to be able to come and see it. I mean, that is kind of extraordinary because it, it goes the span, as you said. Yeah, and that, really right. is challenging. I'd like to thank Her Majesty the Queen for her dedication and for the service she gives to so many people. She is an outstanding, courageous woman 
who is utterly committed to public service. I like to paint, and I hope she likes this portrait. I think she's an amazing human being, and I wish the Queen a very happy platinum jubilee. There's a lot of things here. It's a whole bag of worms. It really is. It's a... Uh, or bag of beans or depending on how you what your local expression is there's a lot in here it's very problematic it's very gray and it's very very emotional people get very emotional about when we went to dubai they did a small announcement they do everything in shopping malls over there something quite interesting for, for a cultural project but anyway they do shopping malls and they gave an announcement that ada would be there on stage and several thousand people turned up and the response to seeing her on stage, we had to get barriers erected in the end because they were pushing and going closer and closer. And we were alarmed by the security of the robot. So she really does engage, provoke and worry and celebrate the future. So there is so much in here. Are there artists now that are wanting to, you know, create like her? You know what I mean? Like, is she becoming her own you know, school, so, and I was thinking when you're, yeah, yeah, Dada, for sure. She's not, yeah, but, you know, there's always been copycats and 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 people wanting to it, but we we encourage that. We would like more people engage with AI because the more people engage properly with AI, the safer the world we will have. And artists are often prophetic, so if we can get artists involved that looks at the prophetic side of where we're going as a humankind, that would be extremely helpful. How do you take care of her? I mean, you know, how many, what is the security around it? You know, and, and how, you don't have to tell us the details, but, you know, how yeah, she's serious. Well her. She has her own studio. It's a genuine studio. She really does make all the artwork in her studio. It's designed for her. It's quite uncanny though, because she has facial recognition. So she follows you around the room when you're in getting ready her paints and stuff like that. She's following you and you can speak to her. So it's quite an uncanny feel to be in her studio. People come and see her, of course. The great and the good would love to see her, and they do. We arrange that on a, an appointment basis. But uh, there's a lot of intrigue, a lot of curious, curiosity. Do you think there's going to be a school of this? You know, there'll be now a whole group of, of creation. I mean, obviously it happens in music and, you know, sort of the computer algorithms can create music and we've been doing that's been happening for a long time but where does this go I mean you you started with you wanted to look at this problem and do you feel more settled or more worried about the problem I think we very much upset ourselves we thought we knew it was about the greatest artists look at the world that is the things that are bothering the world that upset the world that make the world feel uncomfortable and actually, the more we've looked into this, the more upset and worried we've become, in actual fact. It's not helped us. So as we are understanding of where we are going as a world, it does bother us, actually. And that causes a lot of passion for the project so that people can discuss their future so that they can then have control over that. So, you know, you have, uh, you know, the idea of AI as a, you know, we're getting to the point of like societal norms of of AI. Is it is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? You know, it's 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 here to stay. You know, you've talked about the idea of cognition. You know, we're not at the um, at the point technically where a computer can think, although we do see it making decisions we can't anticipate. So, where are you on that? Spectrum? Yeah, my my worry is not AI. AI is a bit like the internet. Is the internet a good thing or a bad thing? When I was in COVID. I was very grateful for the internet because I could see and speak to my loved ones. It's a very good thing, the internet, but it's also used for a great deal of harm and corruption. So I see AI is like that. It's not actually the technology, it's the people who use it. And my worry is that the 20th, the 20th century did not give us a good record of how humans are with each other. So I think it's going to be used as a tool that will be looked at in lots and lots of different ways. And my fear is how humans will use it for their own end. You know, we're starting to see computation, you know, as we see quantum chips get incorporated into it, you know, we, and we really don't know how they work. How do you think that'll affect the, the algorithms? 
Well, it's the, it's the, again, it's the data. It goes back to the data that supercomputers coming through means bigger data sets can be used and the accuracy can be far greater. Harari says we're going to be hacking the human to a point that we understand every algorithm that runs a human. Once we can crack that, we can then manipulate it, of course. So I see that the massive data sets that are coming through are very much more than just the new oil. I think the data sets are beyond the new oil because they can have such incredible power, not just wealth. And so I think as the supercomputers are able to crank up ever more complex algorithms to solve ever more complex questions, I think the results are going to be huge shifts in knowledge in how we conduct the world. We will be able to crack things like poverty because the complexity of the algorithms that will come through to be able to do that. You know, we have challenges where, you know, there is computation that's trying to build a, a, a view of the world. We're trying, to, we're trying to take everything in the world and be able to turn it into an algorithm itself. But we still have that, that problem of where reality meets the computer. You know? So do you see us being able to traverse that in a more effective way over time? I think technologically, yes. I think the human condition is going to get in the way of the desire of how we do it. My worry is never the technology. My worry is always the human. Yeah. I mean, is, is Ada actually solving, a, started making a first attempt at visually taking the world apart and making it into to art? You know, is that a part of building these algorithms so that they reflect reality in some way eventually? Um, reality is an interesting word. <laughs> I think there's multiple understandings of what that word is. Um, I don't think Ada has a response herself to the world around her. Our fear is ecological. You know, I think the world is needing to wake up that we do need to start looking after this planet in a way that we can't imagine now. I think we need to radically rethink the capitalist approach in exploiting resource because ultimately we are going to exhaust the planet. And I think we do need to have a a global conversation to get us to be able to look after this most astonishing mechanism of life. AI will have a part to play in that, but you'll notice I'm talking about people rather than technology. You know, Shakespeare, Milton, Miles Davis, Picasso, you know, are you are you seeing Ada really working at this very edge of what is excellent? Does it recognize what's excellent about the human condition? I wouldn't use the word excellent because that takes a position, I think we will certainly be asking questions of our time. And I think I'm hoping that Ada and her work and the impact that she has will help us to get a fresh perspective so that we have a much more stewardship approach to life itself and that we are actually, rather than being territorial and, and tribal, we will start to be considerate to the condition we're actually in. Is Ada thinking about the, you know, the ecology of the world, or is it more focused on the artwork of the world? She, she doesn't think, uh, but she is computing d data sets of the visual and ecological considerations, yes. Mm. The, as I say, the first show was entirely to do with climate change and the world that we live in. And so we used quite a lot of data for her to process to actually approach some of those subjects. Yeah. Which was astonishing because it was also at the time that Greta Thunberg rose in her protest. And so the serendipity of Ada pushing out her first major show and Greta Thunberg was the timing was, I think it was in the same month. And of course, we didn't know about Greta and Greta didn't know about us. And it was a quite extraordinary how those two things came on the scene at the set, literally at the same time. You know, Ada could make art all day long, every day, could make thousands and thousands of paintings. How do you choose what is going to go in the show? Um, she doesn't do that, in actual fact, because we, we don't allow her to. Our biggest passion is innovation. So each show we try and innovate. Can you believe we try and do that for every show? It's exhausting. So the output is a, a cloth according to the innovation. So the shows are not enormous conglomerates of lots of different work. It usually is exploring one message 
one idea and one approach. So they're not big, you know, she can churn things out, but that's not our interest. Our interest is not commercial so much as that it's got to pay for itself. The interest is to innovate and have a different perspective on living. Well, it certainly seems amazing. Uh, congratulations on it. Um, I know it's exhausting. That's that I do know. It's pretty yeah. overwhelming. It's, yeah. it's, it's extremely overwhelming, especially the interest in her. We'll be coming to the States for sure. We've got quite a big plan for next year to come to the States. You'll yeah. hopefully see that in the press. And it's very, very exciting. But we do take our responsibilities very seriously. It is an ethical project about asking questions of our time rather than any kind of celebrity or any kind of exposure in that way. Our, our interest is much more to do with the work and to do with addressing issues of our day. I have one question on the side. I just a that poor guy who came in and you, he was good, but you were rejecting him. Have your thoughts around what makes distinguished an art great? Has that changed at all? Um, our understanding of great is actually for the common good. So great is as in uh, it addresses issues of their day to try and explore and navigate where people are at at any given context. So the greatest artists are those that have affected the most people in their societies at that time, rather than anything that's technical. My understanding is the impact for good that the artist has. You know, it's, it seems like rather than it being its own independent thinking robot, even if thinking is the wrong word, that it, it's really symbiotic, you know, between your your team and, and the robot in terms of fo focusing it on questions and areas where the answer would be interesting. Is that accurate? I, I, I completely agree. In fact, <clears throat> we actually as a project go even further and ask a very simple question, which is impossible to answer. And that is, who is Ada? Who is actually Ada? Is she the programmers? Is she is she a projection of me as the leader of the team? Is she a cultural context? Is she the AI? Who is this person called Ada? And it's actually extremely difficult to answer because mm. there's so many aspects to her that are sometimes even contradictory. So the persona of her and what people project on her versus what she physically is, is very problematic. But again, we want people to realize that avatars are, are problematic. We keep growing her um, over time as data sets and computation increase. Can you yeah, she's already developed hugely since we launched it three and a half years ago. Mm. She's, she's already way more capable than she was back then. And we will continue developing her yeah. as time goes on. Is she going to age? Are you going to like, you know, physically, will she get gray hair <clears> or whatever? It's a great question. The whole world of life extension and ability to live is an area that she did. The project she did in Cairo was actually about the CRISPR technology and gene replacement. And so the artworks that she did were directly addressing CRISPR technology and how that can inform a way of changing a human to a point where they actually become a different type of human. And so, yeah, that, that's a huge ethical issue in itself. And so Ada's artwork has reflected that. Because in our time, we are likely to have someone born that will live to 150, even in our lifetimes already. And we, we can only see as the technology develops, that's going to increase. So this whole world of how long to live. I know Google has just recently bought a company that are actually looking at life extension as well. So there's a lot of development in this area and we shall see where the technology takes us. Well, thank you very much for sharing with us, Aidan. This was fantastic. And, you know, really appreciate the insights into what you're doing. And, you know, love to have you back on again, you know, as, you're, as the story keeps developing. Definitely. It, it's, an, it's a changing story, and I don't know quite know what you were expected. I've, I've kind of monologued, and I apologize for that. But there's just so much information, and it's trying to ascertain what people are wanting to talk about. It is a very, very large, as regards its ethical questions that it raises, a very large project. And so there is so much material here. We have no shortage of stuff to talk about. So, yeah. <laughs> and, now, do, you, and, do you miss just going through the box of pre-Raphaelite stained glass windows? or <laughs> Absolutely. The days where 
possibly life was a little simpler yeah. that would be that would be good but you know what a privilege it is and what a responsibility it is to be able to have this and you know it's a serious arts project and we're passionate about ethics and we we feel that we would try and navigate some of the questions that are relevant to our times wonderful thank you very much one one last question before you go what was picasso yeah. struggling you know, um, so basically, Picasso is a particularly interesting artist, partly because he was involved with so many art movements. But if we just go to his Cubist movement, which, of course, he authored and innovated with, was very much the idea of a fixed view, top down world that Picasso was born into. And then that was changed as modernity came in so much so that the top down threat of people having different opinions it resulted in World War I. So Cubism kind of showed the shatter of the single view, the collective view of what life's about. And so Cubism is very much the shattering of a single understanding of life and the rise of modernism. He is very much a, a father, one of the many fathers and mothers of modernism to question where the different types of approach to life is acceptable and i think what picasso did with shattering that single image into cubism into many forms was the beginning of realizing that we are all quite different although together and i think his cubism was able to do that very effectively thank you so much for that answer yeah. thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much very much it's great we'd love to see you again thank you yeah. so much Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day. Take care. You too. Bye.